Hey everybody. Um, I was working on a um, a classic, a vintage reel-to-reel monorail tape player recently. Something I was going to give to a friend because, uh, in exchange, uh, he gave me a complete uh, Heathkit H89 computer system. I think it's more than a fair exchange. It was nice of him to offer that to me. But when he said he was looking for a uh, reel-to-reel monorail tape player to play some old tapes he had, it's like no problem. I'll, I'll give him what I have. Uh, the the issue was I picked out a uh, Sony TC105, uh, which is a nice portable uh, tape player. It's about, uh, when it's all closed up, it, it's about uh, 15 inches by 15 inches by about 8 or 9 inches high. has a built-in speaker. You know, the cord comes out of the side from a closed-up door. And it'll play the full 7-inch uh, reel-to-reels, but in, in monorail form. It would also do recording. And I had that for a couple of years. I I used it a few times until I got some nice uh, stereo ones, and I'm using the stereo ones now. And when I put it away, it worked. It's one of those, you know, it, it worked when parked. And so I get the thing out, and I go to plug it in to test it to make sure it's still working, and it, it powers up. Uh, but then I just turn the knob off. It has one of those clicky on-off potentiometers. For, you know, it's on-off volume, so... Uh, it clicks off, and then you turn it back on, you, you click it, and then you, that's also for volume control. So I turned it off, and I went to get some tapes to put it. I uh, loaded up the, the uh, a tape to test it, went to turn it on, and the control knob just kept spinning. So something broke inside of it. And the day I discovered that, which was yesterday as of the date of this recording, um, I actually did a video after I took the assembly apart and got down to the control itself, I decided to do a video which shows me tearing apart the control to find out what's wrong with it. And yes, I can buy a new control. At least I thought at the time I could buy a new control uh, rather easily. It's just a potentiometer with an onboard switch. And granted, it's about 40 years old, but you know something's got to be able to replace it. And um, in the video that I did yesterday, I had one problem. Those who've seen a couple of my more recent videos know knew that I started using uh, Open Broadcasting System or OBS to to do these videos because it's so easy to use uh, once you have everything set up properly. Uh, I had set up a scene with a camera pointing to the uh, recorder, the the um, reel to reel recorder, and one thing I forgot to add in the scene was an audio source. So I have several minutes of me doing stuff, tearing that apart to see why the, uh, the the potentiometer was bad, but no audio. So I thought, okay, um, I'll leave that be. Maybe I won't post that video. And then I, after I did all that stuff, I went looking for a replacement control. And they are out there. It's a 10 kilo ohm audio taper control. It's just, you know, it's a single gang, so it's only for monorail, so it has three pins for the potentiometer part of it, and two pins for the power. Although, by its design, the power, uh, the, the two pins are actually two wires uh, that come out, but those can easily be cut and soldered to a new one that has uh, solder lug terminals or something like can solder to uh, for a modern replacement. The problem is the shaft of the potentiometer, and I have part of it here from the disassembly, the shaft, this shaft from the panel itself, where it would mount to a panel, to the top, is about one inch long. And you can't find them that way, one inch long, with single gang and with a switch. I, I, looked, I looked at Mauser, I looked at DigiKey, I looked at All Electronics Corp. I even looked at some manufacturing or manufacturer websites for them, and they just don't have what I need. It also has to have a knurled uh, tip on it. I don't know if you can see that knurling. That's that's so the uh, uh, the cat the, the the knob can actually go to it. I had no luck, so here I am. I got this thing. I could probably rig something else in there. Maybe just a plain old potentiometer, and, and an on-off switch that's housed or mounted elsewhere. And, and and this person will be fine with that. That it's that won't be a problem. He's he's pretty easy going like that. However, I see a challenge. Uh, and I like these kind of challenges, whether they work or not. I like the idea of uh, 
working around a challenge. The challenge is I'm going to rebuild the piece that broke inside the potentiometer. It's actually a little plastic piece that controls the sweep for the, uh, the potentiometer and also controls the on off switch mechanism inside the potentiometer. And so what I'm going to do is, even though I did a video and did a lot of talking that wasn't recorded yesterday uh, when, I, when I went over it, I am going to play that video now in this stream and uh, narrate it to show you what led to, to this point. And then after that, I'm going to show you how I go about designing replacement parts. Not an expert at it. But as I said, it's a challenge and it's a challenge I enjoy. So I'm going to play the video first. And if this, if I have it all set up in OBS properly here, uh, I will be able to play just the video. And, uh, well, let me show you something real quick. Let me show you what, what happened to the plastic piece. Let's see. You know what? Never mind. I'm not going to do that. You'll see it in the video and then we'll discuss it later. Um, but I am going to... Uh, switch over this video that I recorded yesterday, and then I'll narrate it. I forget how long it is, several minutes, but uh, I'll, I'll do my best to narrate it along with what I think I was saying yesterday when I was recording it. So uh, let's go to this video and continue. All right. So this is the tape recorder opened up. I had removed the potentiometer from the panel that it was mounted to. As you can see, it's, it's a volume control. It, it, it's supposed to go 270 degrees, but this will turn 360 degree, degrees in any direction over and over again. Uh, so it's not supposed to do that. Those two white wires, those are the power uh, wires coming in to the switch that's built into the base of the potentiometer. Okay, so you can see a little more of the of tape player and a little bit more of the mess I have on my workbench you know what I'm just gonna leave that mess that, that's me yeah <laughs> that's what I do uh, I, I think if it's too clean I won't be myself uh, so I zoomed in I was setting the camera up to get a better shot of just the potentiometer as I work on it because what I was going to do is tear apart the potentiometer I don't know what I was doing here. I think what I did is I had paused the video so I can go get my tools, which were in another room. And anyway, um, shortly, I, I don't know if you can see, there's little tabs that wrap around the base where that knob is. Uh, I will need to lift those tabs in order to um, get to the inside. It's actually rather easy to disassemble, so... We'll just wait here and see. I don't know what I was talking about at this moment. I may have just been saying exactly what I just told you now, so I'm not going to repeat myself. Maybe I'll just use this time to take a sip of my coffee. Okay, well here you see the bottom side, the almost the Bakelite plastic, the, the, the red plastic. That contains a switch mechanism, and I was hoping at the time that wasn't broken. If that was still intact, then I knew if there was something broken inside, it was probably, hopefully, a plastic piece. And plastic pieces, with today's technology and, and uh, 3D printing, are easy to print. Uh, recreating them, the, the design, can be a little difficult. But I've, I've done a few things like that in the past. Maybe this is the point where I... Uh... Okay, sorry for the little bit of a jump there. I had somebody come into the room, and I didn't know how to pause or stop the video that I was playing in OBS here. So let me try this again. I'm going to continue playing the video and see if it works. Um, getting back to the video, I, um, I went and got the tools at this point. So, Phillips screwdriver, flathead screwdriver, and two types of pliers. 
depending on what I need to pull apart. But what I actually ended up using to open up the potentiometer is my trusty little uh, Leatherman that I got free from DigiKey uh, for, on a Twitter contest. You see I have that really small screwdriver bit at the, the bottom. It works really well for prying into things and it's a really sturdy item. Now what I needed to do here is make sure that uh, go to pry those tabs. I didn't have a finger or thumb in the way. That would that would not make my day. Uh, so I was worried about the, the thickness of the metal here and being able to get that that screwdriver under there. But it looks like it, it pried up pretty good. That one lifted quite easily and I'm just kind of rearranging my uh, activity here so I'm not getting my thumb too much in the way. But it, I do get the second one opened up pretty easily. And on under the same, see, you can see it's starting to pry open there. And the other two actually opened just as well. Also, once I got the tip of that screwdriver blade underneath there. Okay. My big biggest worry here is that the three go easy, the fourth one's always going to be hard. But hey, luck was on my side yesterday. But, um, there we go. And, you know, I can't record anything without somebody. Uh, sending me a text or something like that. Uh, I really need to uh, learn to mute my phone when I do this stuff. Anyway, so you can see I, I'm able to lift that the, the shaft off. That's a piece I showed you earlier. Uh, not much to it. And I try to I try to find the camera because I'm, I'm zoomed in so far. You can see that it's not exactly round. It's got two flat sides once it gets in focus again. Uh, those two flat sides uh, were to go into a piece of material that will allow it to turn it. And uh, getting back to the potentiometer as I try to once again figure out which way is up from the opposite direction of view. You can see, there we go. You can already see there might be something wrong on the inside. So there it is. There is the actual, you see all that? That looks like goo, but it's actually clear plastic. It's yellowed a bit, but it has gotten brittle. And here I am. I'm, I've got a poker in there. It, it's all shattered. You know, the plastic's all shattered. So that piece is going to be a puzzle. I just kind of scoop it out. There's a little bit of somewhat gooed up lubrication that holds it all together, but I take that out. There is the wiper for the potentiometer. Again, me trying to figure out which direction is up on the camera. Uh, I have some big chunks there, so that gives me some idea of the shape of the piece. And there's the, the wipers. You can see it's just a, a sweep or like three, three pins, metal wiper. The, the wiper has two holes which mount to the plastic piece to help hold it in place. That's the part I'm going to try to recreate. Uh, there's more of the plastic. I, I, I will have a puzzle, and you'll see how I try to assemble that puzzle. Uh, there, there, it, I believe I was able to capture all the plastic out of it. There might have been a couple slivers. I don't know what kind of plastic this is. It may have been, I don't know, does nylon come in clear form? Um, and considering the age. Okay, so there, I'm gonna, this, that's the actual switch mechanism. Uh, I don't know if I can get it in the video very well, but that squared off piece there. That's the actual switch. That's the part that goes click, and it has to swing from one side to the other, which I believe I demonstrate shortly. Which means on that plastic piece, there's probably something sticking out, which will go into that to allow it to move with the, the, the turn of the potentiometer. Okay, there's the resistance, the carbon material, the resistor material for volume control. And you can see the three trails running through it from the three pins there that slide on it. Uh, the assumption is I won't have to do anything with that carbon material, that it's still good and it's still going to work. I've just got to be able to get that wiper in the same spot. But the switch, I'm trying to figure out which way it goes at this point. I think I figured that, one, and I hope I show it when it actually happens. I was trying to push, bend. Uh, and it took me a while to figure out that it actually just goes from the one side of the opening and swings over to the other side of the opening. So the volume control 
needs to have a pin or protrusion on it that will shift into that segment. I think I was talking about something else here, completely different before going back to the switch. I think I was actually describing a potentiometer at the time. I, I really wish I had the mic on because I would just insert this video before uh, I go to design the piece. And at this point, I was expecting to be able to find a suitable replacement online without having to find somebody who has one that can sell me the part from it. Uh, so I'm going back and poking around. I, I keep thinking that it's going to move up and down for some reason, but it doesn't. And eventually, as I said before, Eventually, I learned that it swings from one side to the other. Now I'm in my own world because I'm not <laughs> keeping track of where I am on the camera. Oh, there it is. You see it? It slid. It rocked back and forth. That's the on-off mechanism. So I think it to the right is off because obviously it wasn't powered up and that was the default position. And then when you turn the knob, a little protrusion is supposed to swing that. And then the protrusion will sweep around and away from that point. So when you turn it back again, that protrusion will go back in there, and as it continues to finish turning, it will swing it back the other way. So that's off, that's on, off, and of course, when it's in the on position, it's sweeping around. So uh, I think I'm going to uh, end this video here. I don't know how much is left on it, but that should explain what went wrong with it, what it's... Um, supposed to do and how it's supposed to work and my ideas of what I need to have on the replacement plastic piece because at this point I didn't know what it's going to look like. I could not visualize it. So getting back to me. I uh what I have right in front of me right now is the broken up plastic pieces that I said I was going to show you. And Let's see. There we go. So these are the broken up plastic pieces. Let me get some some pointing mechanism here. So and, and you know, bear with me as I look down in front of me and also look up at, on the screen to make sure I'm keeping everything in view. Uh, this is the the wiper for the potentiometer, you know, electrically. Um, this is sort of the base piece. On the, on the arm, it's, um, I don't know how much I can zoom in here, but you kind of get an idea. We have to, or I have to worry about, there's definite relief to this. There, There's a protrusion sticking up here on one side of it. Other than that, it's pretty much just flat plastic of a fixed thickness. And then there's uh, this part here that's sticking up. And I believe... By looking at this, I bet when it went completely around, it was um, one whole, basically, circular piece that uh, it goes around there, and that would have went inside you know, the inner part of this. You can kind of see, I'm getting light right there, you can kind of see a little plastic tip point. That, that would be one that goes into one of these holes here. Uh, the other side's broken off, but it is down here. That would be this piece. This piece has, uh, see the other plastic tip? Right there. So, I gotta start visualizing how this looks and how this would work. And one way I could do that is, of course, just to hold it together. If I had some crazy glue on me, I'd probably tack this together. I can still kind of feel a little bit of um, the thickened up um, lubricant that was in here originally. However, piecing this together, I think it goes like this. See, we're starting to form a circular shape. And the 
The one thing it doesn't look right here is those pins. That pin looks too far away. We, they should be opposing each other. I'm betting it goes like this instead. I think that's a little closer matched. That will put pins opposite each other to the center of the hole in the middle. And you can see the hole is starting to form a more rounded rectangular shape, which will match the rounded rectangular shape at the end of the shaft. And the two flat edges. So that would go there. And this piece has some relief on it in two different directions. Here is get the light on here so you can see it better. Okay, so this part here is the the protrusion that sticks up that's going to hold this in place. The other side, right here, that's the protrusion that's going to turn the switch on and off. That's what I have to recreate, and it has to be at the right arc on the finished product. Uh, I'm guessing, since I can't really lay this flat, I guess this would be this would be nice if I had like um, a little bucket of sand I can lay this in because I can push items in that had sand. So I'm going to assume it's going to go like this because of the way. Let me see if I can't uh, wires to hold this better. Don't have any tweezers on it. I'm trying to complete the arc, and if I put this here. You can see that the the protrusion on the opposite side that's supposed to go through the switch thing is not directly across from this piece. And that would make sense because going back to the, um, the that, that video I showed you, when that switch is in the closed position, that piece of metal is off to one side. So this would make sense that, I, and I believe the wiper part of this actually goes over this plastic part. I think this uh, this would go this way. I'm just going to throw it all together, right? Uh, this would go this way because then these two mounting poles will line up to the pins. And then this piece would then, when you turn it this way, which would be you know on, then this would slide. That pin would flip the switch and continue moving around, rotating around to uh, stay out of the way while the tensiometer does all the work. So this is this is the fun. I got to recreate this. So how do I recreate it? Well, I've done things like this before uh, to replace certain parts that were kind of symmetrical in nature. Uh, one of the one of the things I done a long time ago for my Magnavox D8443 boombox was to replace a helical uh, gear, helical toothed uh, double gear that is the heart of the play mechanism. And I used a program called Blender to do that. And the way I saw it was there was two concentric uh, cylinders, each having teeth on their outer rim, put them together, you have a gear. And I use a program called Blender, which uh, I'll show you right here. Don't let it, uh, that's Blender. Blender is a very good multi-purpose 3D design tool. It, in fact, it's overkill for what I want to use it for. However, it does what I need. Uh, and, and I can use, there are other products out there which are simpler, like uh, Tinkercad, I think is one of them. Uh, it's just, I know Blender. I've been using Blender for a long time, and I just kind of know my way around it. So this is um, not necessarily going to be an exercise on learning how to use Blender. It's an exercise on recreating something that's broken uh, from scratch, and all you need are, are some good measurements. So getting back to the broken piece. I am going to grab a, um, a tablet, or I mean a piece of paper, 
and I'm going to take some measurements. I'm going to pause this video. You probably won't see a thing. Uh, pause this video. Go get something I can write down some measurements with because I got to get some key measurements here. Okay, I just realized that, uh, you know, this is the 21st century. I don't need pen and paper. Uh, I can just open up Notepad and, and, and type in what I need there. So I'm going to I'm gonna actually move something in the way here. I, I, although I can see what I'm doing, you know, you get old and you need a little help. So I'm going to slip in my overhead magnifier, light up the scene a little bit. This gives me the ability to see stuff like not that good there. Piece of hair. Um, so, uh, getting into this, I gotta I gotta visualize what I'm making here. And what I see so far is we're gonna have a center core defined by this and defined by this. So I'm gonna need an inner core dimension. A cylinder basically the diameter of this opening and for that I have my trusty Micronta uh, dial calipers I've had this thing forever and it, it always worked for me it never really failed now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use millimeters because blender works better with millimeters and I can get some finer resolution by the numbers uh, in millimeters and I'm sorry you're gonna see this upside down uh, just because of the way my overhead camera is. So the first thing I'll do is I'll measure the inside diameter of this. Okay, sorry for that little jump in the recording there. Somebody opened up the door and was coming back in. So that may happen while I'm doing this. This is sort of an impromptu video. So anyway, I want to measure the inside diameter of this. So I'll use the inside diameter measurement side of the calipers and if I'm getting the exact middle of it that would probably be the largest that I can measure we're talking about okay this says 8.3 millimeters I think that's the biggest I can get from there and if my first rough design doesn't work hey it's a 3d printer I'll just redesign it and not redesign it but alter the, the final object and do it again so in notepad here we have uh, I'll call it the inside diameter uh, 8.3 millimeters and then another thing we'll need is the um, distance between both support pins and we'll need the support pin diameter and this is where some of the numbers can get a little hairy because I have, even though I have the distance between support pins where do I measure that I like to use center reference, you know, for anything because it's real easy to, to move around, especially since the support pins are cylindrical in shape. I'd rather use the center of the circle side of the cylinder. Uh, the support pin diameter will give me what I need. So what I can do is I can measure the, the spacing between the outer edges of both support pin holes and then subtract um, half of well, no, actually, I subtract just one width of the support pin hole, and that'll give me the center points between the two holes. Uh, there's, that's information that I'll need. So back here, we got, and this is this is going to be tough. I might actually have to stop and find like a uh, um, drill bit set to see if I can't slip a drill bit. Uh, a fine drill bit in to get the actual diameter of the holes, but I'm going to give it the old old college try here, as they say. So I get, I put that in there, I get 1.27 millimeters, but you know what? Because of the, the amount of play, I'm going to do 1.2 millimeters for each hole. So I'm 
port pin diameter 1.2 millimeters and the distance between both support pins what did i say i was going to do with that i was going to um, measure from the outside again i need to put this in view so you can see it i'm sorry if i'm blocking that i need to measure the out from the outside of both of them and i get 14.2 i'll round up 14.2 so i get 14.2 for that distance Fourteen point two millimeters. So that means the center spacing between support pins is and did my coffee hit me yet? All right, so we got fourteen point two. So half a well, one support pin would be one point two. So we're talking thirteen millimeters. So it's thirteen millimeters between the center of the two support pin holes. And if I'm wrong, I know you're yelling and screaming about it. I'll figure it out if I make a mistake. Next thing I need to do is get an idea of the diameter of what the finished item was. Again, putting things in camera view here. I need to know what my full diameter was here. And I could take a guess. I don't think it will make much difference if it's too narrow too wide one way or the other I, I just don't think it'll make that much difference i think the more important thing is um you know the the diameter of this which um okay let's just do that now i need to know the center of the plastic that's going to hold this so the diameter of the, the beveled notch is we got 3.72. I could probably deal with a little bit of free play in here. So let's just do, what happens if I can scroll this to 3.8? Do I have much? 3.8 might work. Oh, wait a minute. There's something wrong here. Oh, do you see that? I don't know if you can see that. It actually bevels out at the top. It almost mushrooms slightly. So, I actually need to measure across the top like this. See the change, 3.7 to 4.16. Let's just do 4.2. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll learn how to get this in view. Uh, so, 4. Point, I could probably get by with 4.2. And I'm just taking into mind any printing tolerances that may come up during the print. But for this, I will be using. Uh, my SLA the resin printer because I can get more precision out of smaller components. Plus, the resin has a fair enough um, durability to it. And since it's actually going to be inside a control, I won't have to worry so much about uh, UV lighting getting in and oxidizing it and not oxidizing it, but causing it to go brittle. So we'll do 4.2 for the diameter of the beveled edge. And then the actual shaft itself is. 5.25 so shaft bez or shaft um yeah bevel was let's say 4.2 and shaft diameter is 5.25 okay Now, those are some critical dimensions. Now I want an outside overall diameter of the plastic piece, excluding that that little the little pin sections here, uh, because I can make that as long as it's not too wide and that it'll fit inside the housing. I'm pretty sure I can work with uh, less tolerance there. So I'm going to see and hope if these two points, even though it's broken off, if they're close enough together, see how that's closing up when I do this, 
All right, so I would say, look at that. I got the number 12.99. Let's just make this 13 millimeters. I think it's a 13 millimeter wide uh, base shape. And that's how you have to think about this stuff. You have to um, visualize your item. At least it works for me that way. Visualize the object as a myriad of basic shapes that were all put together in a, in a virtual environment. So uh, diameter of, what, what can I call this? Um, I'll call it the, 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 the speed, for lack of a better word. And it's 13 millimeters. Okay, so I have, I can make the overall object size and looking at, where's the piece that had the switch on it? That's, that stuff's still sticking to itself. See, this is all part of the suite. There's nothing sticking out in this direction. So this is still the outside of the circle. And there's the on off switch protrusion. I just got to figure out where at and where that's going to be. But in the meantime, again, set the things out of view here on it. Um, I have to figure out what this extension is going to be and how, how important the thickness of this, this tab here. Trying to get this in the light at the same time. I keep forgetting I'm looking through this lens that's well lit at the right angle, but this part that's standing off here has to be recreated too. So this extension is coming out. That's my best measurement. I guess my best measurement would be measuring from. Well, let's get the width of it first. So what I can do is I can model the extension part and just slip it in place within Blender on the object and basically weld them together. So this says 7.59 millimeters. So we'll do 7.6 and be happy with that. So what do I call that part? I'll call that the sweep tab. Seven. What did I say it was? Uh, sorry. 7.6. Yeah. 7.6 millimeters. Okay. And there's an arc to this, but I'm going to let that arc be the same as the arc to the inner circle uh, when it's expanded out. It'll uh, it'll still take the shape. I, I think the arc is is the same angle and stuff. What I do need to have now is the diameter of this tab, which happens to be seven point six millimeter wide along the arc, but in the arc it's one point five millimeters wide. So I call that. I'm going to change something here real quick. I'm going to change sweep tab to sweep tab and then sweep tab. Width is the, what did I say it was again? 1.5. And let's spell sweep with the upside down B, otherwise known as a fee. And getting back here, anything else I need that's critical? Yes, I need the diameter of that pin, that switch pin. Placement is going to be of concern. I see two measurements I can get here now. I'll, I'll do the uh, switch pin first, which is 2.3, and I'm going to go with 2.3 millimeters in diameter. But then the other thing, just so I, I have a reference, is I'm going to do the diameter of the 
porous shape. So that looks like it's four millimeters. So the torus shape is four millimeters. I, I forget what they, there's a name for that part, you know, of a torus or a donut. I'm not worried about it. I'll just call it the, uh, I'll call it the torus thickness. So that was what I say. It was four millimeters, the torus thickness. And again, 2.3 millimeters per pin. So, torus thickness was, um, hang on, I was looking at something that was popping up here. Four millimeters and four millimeters and the switch pin. Didn't take the energy here. Oh, there we go. Switch pin was two point three millimeters. Okay. I think that's most of my dimensions. Now the real fun is I'm gonna double check back here. Go back to the, the nest that's here. So I know the overall width of the, the piece is, um, is important because it's got to fit within the housing. And the pin spacing has to match with this. And like I said, if it's not close, I'll just redesign, reprint it, or tweak the, the design and reprint it. Then the these pieces here, they look about the same. Yeah, okay, that would be uh, something else. I didn't have. That would probably be the same. Um, what was it? 1.5 millimeters. But either way, it's going to fit within here. So it'll almost form itself as I create design. So basically, I'm just going to create a cylinder. And I'm going to inset another cylinder to create height. Uh, and, and then I'm going to punch through the hole that's going to contain the shaft and and then it's going to add some volume to the object to create these tabs so I have a place to put the pins that are going to go through these holes and then it's just a matter of proper alignment of the switch pin and that might be a trial and error thing I, I, yes I can put a lot of effort into figuring out but I can also visualize it too um, and I'm not worried if I have to reprint it again because SLA printers for something this size are actually pretty quick. Uh, and and I even have the clear plastic if I want to do it in clear plastic, but I may not. I may do it in a, a gray resin or something. But I do have the, the, the clear plastic resin to, to make it look original. I, I see a little piece sticking out here. I'm moving it out of view again. And I don't know what it's for. See this little, that little tab. I don't know what that's for. I don't know if it was an alignment tab for something. I may just lost. I don't know if it's an alignment tab or what. For now, I'm going to go without it. At least to, to get the design done. You see how some of these little pieces came out of it? Just It shattered. Yeah, it was really brittle. Anyway, I think I have everything I need to both put this in its place and line up with the shaft and hold this in its place and be able to turn on the switch and everything in its proper dimension and placement in relation to each other. So the next step is to go into Blender and uh, See what I can do with this. Okay, here we are in Blender, 
And I will warn you, you probably won't see it yourself. You just might hear a change in my voice as uh, uh, time in this video goes on. I will probably be stopping and starting this video as I do other things around the household. Uh, because this process here can take some time. And I don't want you sitting on you know, a, a silent screen for the longest time. And that's one thing I like about this OBS software is I can just hit pause and it remembers all the settings and I can just continue as if it were, were the live feed. So anyway, so Blender, I'm not going to get too deep into Blender. I'm going to show you what I'm doing uh, you, there, and a little bit of how it gets done. But for the most part, this is just um, a broadcast of the process of creating an item. And I will be switching between several windows on my own computer. You won't see that here. So that will also cause a little bit of delay as I describe this. So the first thing I need to do is um, visualize. See, this is Blender's camera. It's looking at the, this is the center of my 3D universe. Zero dot zero dot or zero comma zero comma zero. Um, so that is the center of the universe in Blender. And because it's the center of the universe, it allows me to work with numbers to uh, create something. For example, I'm just going to do something real quick. I'm going to add a modeling object. No, I'm sorry, layout object. Uh, another thing I'm going to warn you about is, although I know how to use Blender, I easily forget where the menu items are, the, the keyboard shortcuts. I'll, uh, you'll probably see me stumble through that a few times. I don't use it often enough. To remember that stuff especially with other programs i use that use keyboard shortcuts uh, i'm not an everyday blender user i'm like an every month blender user if that I, it's just a tool that i knew but i don't go deep into it and and what's more it seems like every time i go to use blender i gotta update it uh, because a new version's out and it's a you know full open source uh, 3d design program and animation program yes if you have the inkling to do so you can recreate marvel marvel's universe and you can design your own characters all the action stuff like that in this same program that i'm just going to use to design a piece of plastic so it's overkill for what i need but it's i know things in it i can get things done in it and that's why i'm not using some of the programs that are also free that make it easier to engineer something because I'd have to learn a whole new set of input controls. So anyway, just to give you an idea with, with Blender, I'm, I'm going to add an object. So I, I click here, I hit add. Uh, almost every basic object is a mesh. So let's just put a, let's just put a sphere in here. I'm sorry, a cube. There we go, cube. So there's my square. Uh, my square is, uh, where is it here? there we go my square is everything dimensions work as scale so my scaling units are um i'm sorry my scaling units are actually meters but these convert to the 3d print software as millimeters so even though this says one meter everything you see this like 2m okay here's the dimensions two meters two meters two meters that would actually scale into 3d programs as or 3d um, printer, print programs, slicer programs as millimeters. So it's a nice trade-off. Uh, but where this says meters, I'm actually working with millimeters. So this cube is actually two millimeters in the X direction, two, or two millimeters in the Y and, and then in the Z direction. If I wanted to make it four millimeters in the X direction, I can just type in here and do 4M. And there, now it's four millimeters in the red X direction. I wanted to make it taller, make it six millimeters tall. Six mm or six m. There we go. Now it's six um, millimeters tall for my purposes. In this environment, it's six meters to, to scale. But for the when I export this to a 3D uh, printer slicer program, it's going to be a millimeter. So that's that's the direction. And that's actually how easy it is to build things by the numbers. You can see up here, X is the red direction, Y is the green direction, Z is the blue direction. I can hit Z and it'll take me, I'm looking down on the object, hit X, I'm looking down the red line, so now you see the blue line. Uh, I can use the center button on the mouse to rotate and the, the scroll wheel to scroll. Uh, I just like the way this interface works. And I can also take this, click it, 
see how it highlighted in orange and and delete it get it out of my way because that's not what i'm working with i'm not making squares i'm making circles so first thing is i need to go back to um what my again visualizing everything i can start in and work out or start out and work in so what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a cylinder so i'll add a mesh called a cylinder and it uses the default two again i'll say millimeters even though it says meters here two millimeters in the x direction y direction and z direction that's the diameter that's not the radius so i'll have to keep that in mind if i'm doing anything that which is based off of radius i need to divide those numbers by two so the overall diameter of the uh let's see what did i what did i write down here uh the, the full diameter i, I called it diameter suite that's 13 millimeters so i need to make the x and y directions let's see this here see if i do 13 of course i need to go the other direction so i'll hit oh what i do here go here hit tab 13 millimeters oh, that's right it's supposed to be meters 13 m there we go so that's the if you can visualize what you saw before this is the um diameter of the the overall base shape of it because we're going to add a tab off to one side and we're going to put we're going to cut out the center now this thickness assumes it's two millimeters thick and it's not and that's one thing i forgot to measure is the thickness of the piece i knew i'd forget a measurement so i'm going to do that real quick off camera just to get an idea of the thickness of the, the entire uh, sweet plastic and I get 1.8 millimeters make sure I'm not grabbing any, any plastic that doesn't belong in there okay I get 1.8 millimeters so to set that I just go here and do 1.8 and it's a little smaller but this is generally the shape of it 1.8 millimeters tall and 30 millimeters in diameter in both x and y direction and that's our basic shape for this piece although it does look a little thick uh let me measure that again it might just be the perspective view in blender one point no it actually says 1.7 seven maybe i will use that no i got a 1.79 on one side 1.77 on the other i'll stick with 1.8 another thing that may be doing this is um and i'm trying to remember the command for this i think it's the numpad five to go between perspective where natural perspective where things look bigger when they're closer to you and smaller when they're far away if i hit five on the num keypad everything stays locked and normal shape so that that has a better view and i might leave it like this just so i get a bit better visual it's just not it's not to me it's not perfect i actually prefer perspective but i think i'll leave it this way for um oh i'll just give it a shot why not okay so next thing i need to do is i need to punch some holes in here so how do I do that? Well, the first thing I need to consider is actually instead of punching a hole, let's put let's put the what I call that. Um, I forget <laughs> what I use for all the names. Not the torus. Okay, you know what? We'll we'll, we'll punch torus thickness in here. Uh, that was the, the the dimension that was going to be from the outer edge to the inner hole. And I think I got that as four millimeters. So to figure that out, I'm going to take the 13 millimeters of the overall diameter, and I'm going to subtract 
the the torus thickness, which is four millimeters on either side. So that'll give me nine millimeters or something I need to put in its place and punch a hole through this. So to do that, I'm going to add another cylinder. You can see the cylinder is in place. Just kind of right, you know, sharing the same universe as the the first one, but its dimensions are going to be nine millimeters in the x and y direction. And just so I have something easy to see, I'm just going to make it four millimeters tall. That you'll see how this works. It gives me something to grab onto. So when I can select objects like this, then I can select an object like this. Uh, that gives me something, as I said, to grab onto. So I'll, I'll take this. And I'm going to do something called Boolean uh, transformation. And over here, I can do, let's see, where did I put it this time? It's called a modifier. I want to add a modifier to the original piece and call it Boolean. All right, this Boolean requires me to take another object and define an operation for it. So the object I'm going to take is this one, the inner cylinder. I just selected that. Now what happened here, you see how this yellow line formed? It already applied the operation called difference. And the difference operation will combine two meshes in a subtractive way. So it will actually take away the volume of the selected object from the object that has the modifier. Another thing I can do too is intersect them and that puts them both together and makes them, you know, basically merges them. Uh, I can also, um, okay, no, intersect gives me just what's shared between the two. Union puts them both together as one object using both their respective volumes. And of course there's the difference. So I'm going to do the difference, and then when I hit apply, it actually cut this piece with this piece, and I can show you that by selecting this piece and deleting it. There's my cut. Now this may have not been the best order of operations to do this. Uh, there's many different ways I could have approached this. I could have worked cuts out from the center out, uh, but I will need something in the center. Yeah, something actually does not look right here. Let me, let me, um, I might end up having to redo this. Because something that looks too big. I, I'm getting the general shape, but I'm trying to figure out where I'm looking at the original piece now. What's going on with where the shaft goes. It, may, uh, it just might be the way I'm visualizing it. I might be thinking this is, that shaft could take up most of the space and it's just my perspective on it. Could also be that the 13 millimeters or, no, I measured those out, 13 millimeters between you know, two opposing sides of the outer plastics. That I know is correct. In fact, I'm gonna measure it again. Yep, 13 millimeters. Okay. Well, I'll continue. Uh, the next thing I want to add is the, the vertical pieces that are supposed to go up and hold. Actually, this would be a good test if my numbers are right. I'm going to put in the cylinder that the... Um, where is it? Shaft bevel is 4.2 millimeters. Shaft diameter is 5.25. I set this up at 9. Yeah, something doesn't look right. And this isn't the first time I've done things like that. I'm going to start again. The diameter of the sweep. Add. Cylinder. 
the cylinder is going to be 13 millimeters by 13 millimeters by 1.8 millimeters. Okay, so that's that's the full sweep circle. Okay. Inside diameter, that's what it was, 8.3 millimeters. So I guess I am close. Um, 8.3 millimeters was the inside diameter of the, the metal the metal part for the um, tensiometer. So I'm going to add that instead. Uh, I'm going to add another cylinder. This one's going to be 8.3 millimeters by 8.3 millimeters by and this is also going to define the plastic that runs along the inside tab edge to hold it in so I'm going to make it high enough that recreates those plastic tabs that's another measurement I forgot to get and I'm going to get that here right now as soon as I find a piece that has one on it And that's two millimeters high. So I want it to stick up two millimeters from here. And if I'm doing the math correct, everything is centered on zero, zero, zero. That means um, by the numbers, the this red line that's intersecting right through the x-axis, if it's 1.8 millimeters total height, it's actually 0.9 millimeters high from the axis to its top edge and it's from its axis to its bottom edge for the overall 1.8 millimeters. So if I want something to stick up an additional two, two millimeters from the top here, I have to make this, I have to get a number that makes this the same. So we're talking 1.8 is there plus two more millimeters. I'll need uh, four, five, I need it to be 5.8 millimeters. That's more like it. And you know what? I think it's starting to have a better shape. Uh, I can visualize it better right now. But those are the parts that stick up. And I'll just make that be. So I have this. I have this. And next thing I need to do is I'm going to work out and go in. Um, the, the other piece I needed... This is 8.9, so that takes care of that. The next step would be the shaft. Um, I can't see any other reason why I can't put the shaft in there. And for that, I can do some wild work within Blender, but I'm just going to use what they call the primitives here and just do it real simple. I know the shaft has a... Um, has that flat edge. The 4.2 millimeter wide flat edge. One thing I didn't measure is the length of the edge. I need to know how far I need to take out that point. So that's that's 4.8. I'm measuring that right now. I can probably get by with five millimeter. So I'll make it five millimeters. So what I need to put in here is I put a rectangle in here by adding a cube, which is inside this vine, so you can't really see it right now. Let's just drag it up to about six millimeters so we can, okay, right, go a little higher. Uh, let's go eight millimeters. Give me something to work with here. Its X dimension is going to be the bevel width 4.2. And its other dimension is going to be the five millimeters that I pointed out before. Okay, so this gives us the shaft punch out. And when I punch this, I'm going to add a circle to it. And then I will, how would I do this? I would union them. to make what I need, I believe. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to set this aside. I'm going to move this out of the way. 
I need to put the big shift in first. So that's going to be the 5.25. Add mesh cylinder. Again, we'll make this tall. And this was the 5.25, so 5, oops, put 5.25, 5, 5.25, 5, 5. like so. That would be the shaft that we're going to bevel. So that in place. And I made this nine millimeters. How tall did I make this eight? Let's make this eight millimeters too. Eight, ten. All right. So this piece here, which I moved to another location by dragging it, I'm going to put right back in the center again by setting its X, Y, and Z location together. You begin to see what's happening here. Um, I have these two pieces together. If I intersect them i will get the volume of what's available from the rectangle and what's available from the cylinder and it what it should give me is a piece that is curved to some extent uh, let's see I, I just want these pieces so i'm going to make this a little bigger i'm going to make this 5.2 also Is it the right direction? Wrong direction. Five point two. There we go. This was actually four point two. Four point two. Okay. Now I believe I have everything included. I can. So actually, where the shaded area is is what I should have left if I intersect these two let's give it a shot i want to take this cylinder i want to add the bevel modifier i'm sorry not bevel let's remove that one add the boolean modifier to this piece and i want to intersect them oh, i'm sorry intersect them and hit i hope this works Hit apply. Now, I think it leaves the original behind. Nope. I don't think intersect worked the way I expected it to. Maybe I should have done the intersection a different way. Um, let's see, let's go back to where it wasn't intersected. Let me intersect the cube. Boolean, select the cylinder. And intersect these. Will that give me what I need? Yeah, I think I'm running into a little bit of a problem here. Okay, a small cut there. Um, I haven't really used anything other than difference modifier in Boolean operations for this, so I got a little confused. Here's what I'm going to do. It's a little little hokey, but you know it'll still get the job done. Uh, the end justifies the means, as they say. I'm going to redo. I really thought that intersection 
would have just combined the two volumes only where they both touch each other and it didn't behave that way. So I'm going to do something a little, little different. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, delete that, delete that object. Okay, and I'm going to do this. First thing I'm going to do is uh, add another cylinder. And this one was the um, 5.25. I'll make it nine millimeters tall to give it something to grab onto. So that would be the overall uh, center shaft if it wasn't beveled. And for convenience, I'm going to block out those two items from view. They're still there, but I don't have to look at them if I don't want to. The next thing I'll add is, and this is the you know, kind of the strange part, is I'm going to add I'm going to add a cube. This cube is going to represent the bevel like I did before. So it'll be, I'm just going to use the numbers 4.2 by 5.25. And this time I'm going to give it 10 just to make it taller than the object. However, instead of trying to make some kind of union or uh, intersect work, I'm just going to shift this to one side and lop off this piece. So I have 4.2 millimeters in the X direction, so I need to move this 2.1 in one direction, do the same thing again, move it to the other side, two and, and, and use each one to lop off. Um, so I'm going to... This works here. Copy paste. Maybe it didn't work. Um, it did not work. So let's do here. Let's let's duplicate the object. There we go. Now I have two of them. So the first one I'm going to move to the X in uh, 2.1 millimeter direction. Be that. Move it. I'm sorry. It doesn't. It can't be 2.1. It has to be Let's move this one out to minus 2.1. Yeah, see, that's not going to double right. Oh, an additional 2.1. So I, I guess I had to move it the full amount uh, because I forgot again zero center axis. So this is 4.2. And this one. Minus 4.2. Now you can see that if I lopped off this volume from this volume and then this volume from this volume, I will have the beveled shaft that I can use to punch a hole in the center of the plastic. So when it's printed, the, the metal shaft can receive it. So again, we're, now we're getting back to what I know. It's going to be a Boolean, and I'm going to pick this object as the difference and apply it. Lopped off. And this object again, Boolean to this object and apply it. Like that. There's my center shaft. So, uh, and that's just a representation of the center shaft. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to duplicate it. Y, so I have, I can get back to it later. I'll just put it over here somewhere. Um, and I'll set it in the, uh, so we're at zero. There we go. So it's out of my way, because that's, I'm not going to export that. That's just in my design environment. So I have this here. And now when I turn on the other two items, now you can kind of see where this plastic's going to punch through. And I will do that now. That's why I saved this piece. So when I punch this through, I'm going to get rid of the punch, so to speak. And um, actually, one thing I will do is I'll take this, since this is good, and this piece is good, I'm going to union those, or intersect, whichever one works. Uh, Boolean, I want to make them one piece. I'm going to union those and apply. That means I now can take, I can delete this cylinder. And, all right, 
So now I have a single piece there. So now that I get rid of it, I get rid of both of them at the same time. It is the original cylinder now has a new shape. It's defined new shape. Now we're going to punch this hole in this cylinder. So this is the cylinder. Boolean difference between that and this shape. And apply. Now when I take this shape and delete it, there's the hole for the shaft. Now I possibly could leave this be if I wanted to. Uh, you may remember from the, the previous part of the video, this actually had a circle around it, but then the center of the base piece was the um, was the shaft. I don't know if anything will be in the way. So what was that? My my diameter of, of between this this was the inside diameter of the the metal. Um, contact sweep it was 8.3 millimeters and if I wanted to raise these sides and create those those tabs I don't know if I can try to get back into the uh, picture here and show you what I'm talking about okay the all right where did I go did I just knock it off you know, I may have just knocked it off the uh, table. Or set it aside somewhere. Probably when I went up to get another drink. All right, I will find that later, but just to, uh, there might be another piece here I can show you that with. Um, yeah, right, right here, that raised piece. There. That has a certain thickness that was at what 1.2 millimeters I was talking about. Uh, I'll measure it again just to be sure. One point five millimeters. Okay, I, I can still work with that. All right. So getting back to Blender, if I wanted to have a one point five millimeter ring, you know, kind of a torus shape around here, the the, the original dimension is eight point three minus one point five is six point eight. So what I can do is add a um, add a cylinder. That is 6.8 in diameter. And we'll give it some height to work with. Six, six, two, nine, eight. See, now you can see if I punch this through, I would have that ring around there. However, if I punch it through in its current size, I will get rid of the, the whole white beveled. So, I mean, the complete bevel, I'll get rid of the whole thing. So what I'll do is I'll lift this cylinder up. Let's see. I will there's shortcut command. Okay, I'll, I'll just go on the y-axis here. There we go, on the y-axis. I will lift this cylinder up so it is just at the top edge here. And I can easily do that by changing trans transposing its location uh what is it how, how tall did i make it um well okay what let's just move it in the z-axis oops wrong spot to do it in blender if you want to move an object you hit g for grab oops again you have to be out of these prompts here so let's go back here click it Hit G for grab, see how it turns white like that, and then move it in the Z axis. You just then follow it with the Z, and that restricts your movement in that axis. So basically, I'm going to move this up 
4.5 millimeters. And, and to be sure with that, I'll just take 4.5 here. All right, so that's its location. I shifted to 4.5 millimeters. So scrolling back down here, what should happen is actually I want to preserve this thickness. So let's move it. Oh, I forgot to hit Z for just the axis. So grab Z. Hit the button too soon. So we're going to move this to 5.4. You saw what it did there. I didn't want to do any math in my head. So I moved it close enough to where I saw the location change and then just rounded it off uh, manually. All right, so if all goes well, I can punch all this with the, and I will have to get rid of this down here, I forgot. Um, I'll punch all this here with this and it will leave this bevel cut in here Actually, here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to show you how to remove some stuff. I'm going to go ahead and select this object. And when you hit the tab key, you go into object mode where you can actually modify and manipulate the individual vertices or faces or whatnot to alter the actual physical dimensions of the object, uh, fine tune them. So, what I want to do is I want to get rid of this height here. I don't need it because the piece is flat and I will be putting something underneath it when I put the tab on it. So this, one of the ways I can get rid of this is just to remove this face that, that will, and I can do that by removing these vertices. Because once you take vertices away, so you got, in, in Blender you have vertices that are these points and you also have, let me see if I remember where, the, uh, okay, so they're called vertex. Um, or you have what's called uh, edges. Notice how I click here. This is vertices. So the vertices, I can actually individually select these vertices and manipulate them, move them to a new position, whatever. I can, uh, you know, I can hit G for grab and move them to a new spot and alter the uh, physical dimensions. I'll hit escape, go back. Or I can do it with the edges by clicking the edge, grabbing it moving it around. See how that moves that? And then if I lift that there, now I have to right click, uh, let's see, grab, move it. And now if I rotate this, see how I modified that piece. It, it looks looks weird, but I hit control Z, go back. I didn't move it properly. And then, or I can click whole faces. Uh, let me get that. So you see, I can click whole faces and, and do something with that. But every face has edges, every edge has vertices, every face has vertices. So the way you can get rid of faces and edges in their entirety and actually break them up, they almost like pop. Like if I'm gonna get rid of these faces, all I gotta do is remove at least one vertice and the face disappears, it doesn't exist anymore. And if there's not two vertices to make up an edge, uh, those disappear when you remove associated vertices so the best way i can just lop off this bottom is go to vertices and select all the ones i see here i can do that by hitting b draw a bounding box around them and hit delete and i will delete the vertices boom it's gone but you know what happened here that's hollow. That shouldn't be that way. I'll have to fix that later. But you know what? I'm just going to make it easy on myself right now. I'm going to hit Control Z. I'm going to take these vertices. I'm just going to move them up. So, looking at this direction here, I'm just going to, again, select all these vertices. And I'm going to hit Grab. Z, and I'm just going to close them up here. You see where, and, and, and I'm going to move this real quick. See right up here where it's changing as I do this? That just gives me 
a, a position where I want to be. So point minus minus one z. So if I if I leave this b and I just type in here minus one, it just moved it into better position for me. There. Now now that that'll work for me because in the overall completed volume when I hit tab again, you won't see those points. They'll all now be you know, flattened with the rest of it. So that's kind of a trick or a hack because I forgot to do something. Uh, and as I said, I wasn't going to make this a blender tutorial, but you're going to get some of it out of it anyway, just, you know, <laughs> the way I, the way I think. So now when I punch this through this here again, uh, to create this, I will still have my beveled cut for the shaft in the original base piece. So with this item selected, I'm going to add a modifier for Boolean. And I'm going to use this object as my Boolean piece. And I'm going to use difference and hit apply. I take this and then delete it. Now you see what I got here? That metal piece for the uh, potentiometer wipe is going to go around here. And this has a certain height to it. And I believe those are correct by the numbers. Um, and there's that other piece. So I'm I'm slowly building this piece. So the shaft is going to go in here eventually. This ring is going to hold the metal piece in place, which will then uh, hang off of the base. And then now I got to consider making the tabs that go out and the tabs that go to the side with, that have the little pins in it that are going to hold the um, the metal sweep. Yeah, a lot of work getting here, but a lot of it's thinking out loud, and this is just how I do things. Um, I don't always plan it out. I just do things on the fly because every mistake can be learned from, even if you make it twice. You learn twice. See? Two for the price of one. So I'm going to continue on with uh, uh, building this, but I am going to take another break. You won't see it. I'm just going to hit pause and then come back to it later unless... Uh, you know, the power would go out and uh, completely ruin everything I'm working on now because I don't think OBS saves on the fly for uh, power outages. But you can see so far how I'm building this. One of the things I wanted to do also is I, I'm, I created an inset here just to give you the ability to visualize what's going on. Let me see if I can't get these to show up. Again, trying to track my own camera that's over my head. So you see the shape that's on Blender, and you can kind of see this shape, and it is starting to come to fruition. I don't know if you can see that. So even though it looked weird to me on screen in Blender, it actually is closer to what you know what it's supposed to be. Let's see if I can get this at a good angle here and get a pointer to it so you know there there's there's this width here that you can see on, on the blender and then then there's these tabs that come up so they're represented the the center of this piece was completely shattered away so we can only assume that the punch out that i put in blender is working okay now i need to add this tab sticking out and i have a few ways i can do that there's there's more than one way to do anything in Blender. Some of them are just, you know, crude, and that's okay with me. Uh, the other thing I have to consider, too, is, get this back in view, is when I have this, how is it supposed to be in relation to the shaft? I have to, I have to keep that in mind, because the shaft where I have it in, in Blender right now, the, the hole, that may be in the wrong angle. I may actually have to rotate that. Uh, or I can rotate it by figuring out the best place to place this piece. And I may do that offline. I may figure out where I need to stick this tab out from within Blender. And also how far, even though the switch pin, that protrusion, is on the opposite side of this in the replacement piece, it's actually off to one side at a at a certain distance and i have to figure that out too so that might require special measurements for me uh inside the potentiometer housing itself and that's something i i probably won't do on camera i'll just probably figure that out so these are some of the things i have to consider when recreating a part is 
not only its its shape, and, and you saw how I built this from primitive shapes from the ground up using pretty much cutting tools that are built into Blender, and plus a few mistakes and going off onto the tangents and stuff like that. Uh, that's just how it is. That's why I said sometimes it takes me hours to do this. Um, and <laughs> going off on another tangent, is are those hours worth it for this? Uh, this is something I'm fixing for somebody to give it to them, and at the same time, I I can't find a, a replacement part that would fit in there, so this is probably my only recourse. And I have the equipment, I might as well use it. Uh, any reason to, you know, let the, the cost of a 3D printer pay for itself is uh, always good. So, anyway, I just wanted to show here that it is looking like is ex it is expected to look. It just, in real life, real life looks a little different, but I think it is uh, starting to become the, the proper shape. I think I'll see it better once I get this tab in place and then the other parts in place. Okay, um, some things I need to figure out here. Uh, as I said, the angles. I need to figure out. Let's see if I can't get this. I, I zoomed in the camera so you can get a better view of it, but maybe I'm past its focal length, so let me widen this out slightly. You can see how you know the the shaft of this is beveled and stuff, and how it turns in here. So I need to figure out at what angle is that shaft to the rest of the. The piece, or for that matter, what angles its shaft to the plastic piece. Now, one thing I see here is there is a little bit of that bevel shape. See how that kind of just that gives you a better view of it. That shape seems to fit in right there, but if you look at the outer piece, it's certainly off by what appears to be an arbitrary angle. So that's something I'm going to have to deal with. So this angle here, how, how can I measure that best? I'm sure there's many different ways to do it. I think what I'll do is I'll, um, I think that's a good placement to give me an idea. I think what I'll do is I'll use this outer piece as a, an alignment tool. So I'm going to, I'm going to have to move the plastic with it. I was hoping that would on its own. So turn this around until I feel that this this plastic piece is what I call that perpendicular. I guess yeah the plastic piece is perpendicular. The edge of it is not. Uh, I'll just turn this around where it's meshed to a point where I think that the tab is perpendicular to the shaft's mounting base. I think that's... Now, is this one where close enough is good? I don't know the precision or tolerance on this, but I'm going to assume it's that. It looks like it's 45 degrees from... Let's see if I can't get a straight edge on this thing here. Uh, 45 degrees from each perpendicular axis. Let's try this one first. Does that look 45 degrees? Does that look 45 degrees? I could go with that. And if it doesn't work, I can always rotate the, the opening in the original object if I go to print this and it doesn't work right. Some of the things that could go wrong here is the position of the knob might not point exactly at minimum to maximum. It might be off a little bit if this measurement is off. So I could let's see if I can't uh, get this against here. I, I don't have a protractor with me, but that does kind of look like it's 45 degrees. And I'm going to go ahead and work with that. So 45 degrees. Let me let me establish in Blender, get back to Blender here. Let me establish in Blender that 45 degree 
rotation. And for that, we're just, um, we'll set, we'll look down on the Z axis here. So we're looking down here. We, we lose visibility of anything perpendicular because I went to, uh, they call the orthographic projection. That's this mode. If I go to perspective, then I get to see things. But in orthographic mode, this is my x-axis, this is my y-axis, and we're looking directly down into the z-axis. So all I need to do for this, and the other question is, and I, and I guess I can make this determination when I place the tab, is do I go 45 degrees left or right? Uh, if I'm, let's just say I want to put the tab here. It looks like from the original plastic, I want to rotate this 45 degrees counterclockwise. So let's try that. Let's just start rotating and see if I'm going 45 degrees counterclockwise. Okay, that's that's clockwise. So that's counterclockwise. We'll just go to 45. Click, click, click. There we go. That's 45 degrees counterclockwise. So that would work for me. That means I can build my tab off of here. Because the other thing I have to assume is I got the, uh, you know what, that. I, I'm looking off camera here. I, um, in fact, let me switch so you can see what it is I'm trying to think of here. So this is the piece that actually gets mounted into the panel. I think it actually goes this way. This it goes this way. I'm, I'm looking at the panel now. The hole that this tab goes into. Got them zoomed in. That tab goes into a hole in the panel. That means um, off would be here. Full volume would be here. So if this is the off position. That means, now I'm flipping this around. That means the missing side of the plastic has that tab on it. And switch it around this way. So the tab would actually be on the side of the pin. So this is the back. Now, do I mount it this way or do I mount it this way? That's the other important part. I guess I can figure that out by looking for. Uh, the relief on the okay so the pin that holds the the metal wipe in place is here so the wipe is going to be on the top side of this so i would say that that would be the proper direction so i do have it right in blender uh, because this this vertical part here, the, this vertical ring, that's the part that was sticking up when we in our perspective in Blender. So that matches this piece here. So we'll go with this. It, now there's my 45 degrees. That that means in order to continue with that, I need to put the outer tab up here. My numbers for that were, again, the, how did I do that? I did not measure a virtual outer circumference because that tab is really, when you visualize it, is actually a bigger circumference with a lot of it cut away. So the tab width I said was, or the sweet pad, what I call it? I called it the sweet pad. The sweet pad was 7.6 millimeters in length. And I didn't, did I measure that from the inside edge or the out? I think I measured that from, um, the whole diameter. I may have to rethink this. I'm going to measure that instead from 
the this ring edge to the ring edge it comprises of and for that I'm going to take a rough guess I got 5.8 and, and again I'm doing this off camera I got 4.8, let's go a little further here. I got 5.1 millimeters. So I'm going to add 5.1 millimeters. I'm going to design this piece by reconstructing this and making it I want to double check that 5.1 and make it 5.1 millimeters uh, larger in radius. So it would actually be in a 10 millimeters wide in diameter because I was measuring just the radius. So it'd be 10.2 millimeters. Well, let's give it a shot, see what works here. So again, I'm going to recreate this, the original ring, which I don't have in here anymore because I merged it. And the original diameter was um, 13 millimeters. So I'm going to make it 23.2. So we'll add another cylinder. Boy, those are looking small now, aren't they? We'll make it 23.2 it looks like it might work and another 23.2 and how high do I want to make this it was 1.8 so I'm going to stick with that right so that's that I think that works and I'm going to change see if I can't do this there we go I'll go to wireframe so you can kind of see how it how it works it looks like a fair enough extension that if i were to slice here slice here and then get rid of all of this uh, that would work really good so how i'm going to how am i going to slice that again i might be crude about it because i can always fix it later uh, and to do that i'm going to go back to solid view And then I'm going to hide the original cylinder. There we go. See, one thing about Blender, it does have a lot of abilities to it, but it's really hard to actually say, to get measurements, like say, pick a point on the arc here, and then pick another point, and Blender tells you that's the distance. Uh, if it has it, I never learned it nor was it easy to find, nor was it intuitive. Uh, maybe they changed that since I used Blender. I just learned to work without it. So going back to, let's go back to top view here. And I'm going to go ahead and bring that cylinder back in again. There we go. Okay, so now we're looking at top view. Uh, just to give you again what we see here. See how all that comes together. But we're looking at it as a wireframe. I think it'll be easier for me to work with. So I'm going to go back to top view again. And I'm going to guesstimate the arc here, because I might be able to use the vertices that are already on this as a starting and end point, and it might just work. So with this item selected, I'm going to hit tab and go into um, the vertex mode so I can see all the vertices here. And I am going to take, this is going to be the real trick here. How am I going to, I'm basically going to sculpt this. So what's my best way of sculpting it? I have a single point in the middle of the item. Let me turn this off. I have a single point in the middle. 
So what I really want to do is I want to have an arc and it looks like I can go from here to here to create a suitable arc. I want an arc, but I also want the thickness of it to carry through to that. One way I can do that is to just fudge it. And I can do like this. I can hit B, select these vertices. No, actually, I have to hit, there we go. B, select these vertices. And going back to the top view, if I grab them, I can arbitrarily move them in towards the center. But I want to keep these straight, so grabbing them means I need to kind of keep it straight like this. Let me just do this for now. I don't want to go too far. Actually, I want to, I want to put the other one in place so I know how to... There we go. So grab these, move them in to just so they're inside the volume of the other one. The inner circle. And then I'll take these, make sure I've got them both. Go to top view. I hear somebody coming. I might have to pause this. Grab these. Oops. I did the wrong one, so hit escape. Grab these. And move them down to just inside the volume. Like I said, this is crude, but it'll work. Now what I can do is I can grab these, delete them. Notice it's still keeping a lot of the form. And then I can grab, I'm sorry, um, you know what I did? I deleted too much. Let's go back here. There we go. I needed to leave these. No, this goes here. All right, I, I was right. So I'm going to do this again. Let me bulk select these. Delete those. Vertices, bulk select these. Again, it's um, crude. But it works. And bulk select these. Oh, I'm going to include this too. And delete vertices. Okay, so what I have here is a better shape of that tab. Uh, but it it's not a like if I go to faces mode, I have no faces there. What I should have done is connect a few. Uh, vertices together, but that's fine. We, we can do that. I'm going to go ahead and hide this again. Now I want to give this some volume. And to do that, I can select vertices like this and hit F, and it makes a face between those vertices. And then from the side here, I can do the same thing. I can select these hit F, and I got a face. And the same for the bottom. Face. Now I have a solid object. If I go back here, and go into solid mode, there's my tab. And if I bring the other cylinder back in, you can see how it's uh, sort of meshing with it, just the way I want it to be. And you know what I'm going to do right now? <laughs> is I'm going to go ahead and save this. Um, I'm going to save this as, because I, I, I wasn't saving my work all along, and that's, that would end up surprising me. So saving this, um, I'm going to call it um, hot wipe dot blend save as a blender file okay so i at least had that and what i need to do here is make this piece part of this piece and that's a simple 
Boolean operation. So click here, add modifier, Boolean. I'm going to select that piece and I'm going to do a union. Now it's one piece. So that means I could take this, delete it. Ah, oh, I forgot to hit apply. Let's try this again. Hit apply. There we go. Now, <laughs> hide this, take this, delete it. There we go. There's my new piece. It's starting to take shape. And the problem with some of these uh, Boolean operations, kind of see these lines here, is that some things aren't perfectly aligned and what this will create when I hit the tab key you'll see it it creates a lot of excess geometry and for the most part this is okay yeah, it, it's it's usable I can correct it by deleting a lot of these faces and rebuilding it uh, but I'm going to leave it alone because in the end when this object goes to the 3d printer it's it's as long as these vertices and these faces are on the same level, they would just, you know, seamlessly become one. Um, if I wanted to be real picky about it, I would, I would go through and merge these things, micromanage it in a way that, you know, it has to be perfect. And, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to continue with the way this project's supposed to go. So, another thing I need to do is an it didn't dawn on me when I was creating this is I need to create something under here that looks like something under here. How can I do that? Well, I can try an extrusion. I, I haven't thought about this before, but it's possible. I'm going to go ahead and go into... Well, I'm already in it, that's right. So I'm in vertex mode. And I'm going to go into wireframe mode. And I'm going to select all these. Now, if I use a command called extrusion from here, what I would be able to do is I do extrusion in the Y direction. I can actually draw out more volume from this. See how I can do that from that piece? If I go the other way, Oh, let me uh, extrusion Y. If I go the other way, I can um, move things in. Now it will be inside the volume. However, it'll give me some surface area of the new faces it creates to extrude in a different direction. Because in order to extrude, you have to be able to move uh, faces or vert vertices, faces, uh, if you want to keep the volume of or keep substance in the object. So with this, I'm going to hit escape again because I want to get my measurements from my notepad. The sweep tab is 1.5 millimeters. So let me go back to top view here. All right, and then that's selected. So if I, I want to try something here real quick. Okay, it looks like the extrusion was already there. See, it was actually extruded to um, zero distance, so it was a matter of grabbing those and moving them. So I'm going to do this by the book again. So I'm going to hit Control-Z a few times to get me out of that. All right, so we're going to select these, which will select all those faces, and, I'll, and it helps me keep the arc. Go here, and I'm just going to watch my Y distance. Uh, I want to grab the, or no, I'm sorry, extrude them in the Y direction. I'm trying to catch 1.5 millimeters, but you know what? It's not giving me those kind of numbers. I don't know where that's, the, those numbers that are moving right now over here are, are transformation numbers, and I can't visualize the perspective what happens if I do global? Again, like I said, everything's a learning thing. So we'll do global here. 
it says here y is at 11.158 i don't know if it's this point or if it's a an average of these points i'm hoping to see this move 1.5 millimeters in the direction i move and that'll kind of give me an accurate uh, uh calculation so extrude in the y direction looks like i can do that here so what was that original number it was i just need to count down 1.5 so 11.15 let's see 10.15 is one and uh what is it six so if i go to 10.658 that should give me the 1.5 millimeters am i doing my math correctly um Extrude in the y direction. 10.6. Let me put it there. Let me make it a little thinner than it's supposed to be. I don't know if I can change this. 10.65. 10 okay. That looks like it'll work. And now looking at the solid view of this, see, it looks like, see what it did? It actually moved the faces in. So all I need to do now is, um, and I'll have to do them almost individually. Let me go to the top view. And multi-select, make sure this is working okay. Multi select. Oh, here's another thing with um, trying to remember where it's at. There is two modes of selection here. If it, if if you're in a particular view and you can't see the vertices that are opposite what's in view, they don't get selected. You actually have to go into what's known as like an X-ray mode, and I think this allows that show X-ray. Uh, and what that'll do, that'll let you see vertices that were normally not visible. See how you can see the vertices behind them there, but not there. So, um, back to top view. Now I can, if I hit B to select these, and B again with a shift to select these. It looks like it, did I miss it? I missed it. B with a shift to select these. Why isn't it selecting them? You know what? Sometimes you just have to go back to basics. Shift click, shift click. There, hit that. Hit that for face. All right. So click, shift click, shift click. Hate doing it this way, but it'll get it done. So select this. Get this, that, that, hit F for another face, and last time around. Face. Now if we go back to um, solid mode, there we are. We closed the end, but here's what we get from it. And for this, I will go back into this mode. It's getting a little unwieldy here. Now, if I choose face mode and I select this, uh, let's see here, what do we got? You know, we have we have overlapping faces. Um, I may have to fix this. That's why you're seeing this cross hatching. It's overlapping faces. Uh, all I want to do is extrude something. So. I'm going to go back to selecting vertices. If those faces weren't overlapping, this would be a little bit easier, but like I said, I'm just going to deal with it. I'm just going to select all these vertices, which will in turn select the appropriate faces. I get them selected, right? Okay, so I have those four faces selected. And I'm going to use the same uh, tab height 
that I used for this, because I think it is the same height. I'm going to look at that now. Yeah, it looks like it was the same height. So the same height I had this was, oh, what was that? Sweet tab width is 1.5 millimeters. Sweet pad 7.6. Shaft bevel, short diameter. Support pin diameter. I don't think I measured that. Or at least if I measured it, I didn't write it down. So I will measure it. One point five millimeters. So with this, we'll look at the uh, x direction there. So we see our tab. Now I'm going to just extrude this. One point five millimeters. So I hit E in the z direction. See, I'm pulling that down. So we are at point nine. So 1.5 would put it at uh, 2.4. And I can go up here. It's actually negative 2.4. Negative 2.4. There we go. Now, go back into um, solid view and see if I see if I lost faces. Okay. So that would work. That gave me my tab. Again, I'm doing this crudely, but I don't care. It, I'm not an expert at Blender. I just can use the tool to turn visualizations into a realization. So that looks good for me. File. I'm going to do a save as so I can. And this takes a little bit of time to do a save as. I don't know why. Could be because I have other applications running at the same time. And uh, there we go. So we'll call this wipe, pot wipe two. And I'll just alternate between them as I go. I just want to keep a previous version on hand. Okay, so it's starting to come together here. Now, the next step would be our support pins for the metal sweep. And I said those were 1.2 millimeters wide or in diameter. So let's start by adding those. We'll add a cylinder that is 1.2. And I'm going to give this some serious height. We'll do five. There we go. So that's the center of our pins there at zero, zero, zero. The distance between, how did I measure that? The distance between both support pins. How did I measure that again? Did I measure from the outside edge of each one? I should have notated that. Or did I measure from, or did I calculate it based on? The position of where I thought the center of the pins would be. I measured 14.2 from the outer edge to outer edge. So to find out, and I'm going to duplicate this so I have two of them. We'll just uh, duplicate objects. There we go. And I'll hit escape for now. To, so I actually have two objects over the same volume of space here. So if it's 14.2 mil millimeters from the outside edge of the pin over here to the outside of the, edge of the pin over here. That means I need to take half the diameter, 0.6 millimeters, um, and then subtract that from the overall diameter between the outside edges is 14.2. Okay, so I only need to move it, uh, actually it's 13 millimeters space, because i got to count for each one, and half of 13 is 6.5, so I think if I move these each 6.5 in different directions on the x-axis, 6.5, 6.5, 6.5, 6.5, 6.5, 6.5, 6.5, 6.5, 6.5, 6.5, 6.5, 6.5, 6.5, 6.5, 6.5, 6.5, 6.5, 6.5, 6.5,
Did I get that right? No, I have to move that a little further. It's by seven point one. Seven point one. That looks better. And then this one here goes negative seven point one. Negative seven point one. Okay, so that looks like where the pins are going to be. And I'm gonna verify that again. Just by looking at the, um, I found a piece, by the way, I had to set it over to the side, so let me put this in the camera. What I'm looking at here is, from a visual perspective, get that pin in a better light, there we go. Actually, you know what, I had it right the first time. You look at that pin there, and you can see it looks like the outer circumference or outer edge of the main piece would pass right through the center of that pin. And that's what it was doing with the first number. So I'm going to go back here and do the minus 6.5. And then this one here, 6.5. See, I thought I was off by half the uh, diameter of the pin but see that's looking better now looks like it's passing right through like it's supposed to so i'm going to call that a win and then the other thing that had it uh looking back at the um the piece again is it looks like it was surrounded by you know a cylinder like shape that was you know bigger by a certain amount and and actually it looks like it might have been just twice the diameter i'm just looking at the, the shape of that um i'm going to guess it was twice the diameter so that's an easy fix too so twice the diameter of 1.2 is 2.4 so going back to blender i add a cylinder that is 2.4 An X and Y axis, and what did I use before? I'm going to use something slightly smaller right now. I'm going to actually I'm going to use the the, the thickness of the original piece, which was 1.8, right? And I will duplicate this and move the first one to minus 6.5, and move the second one to 6.5 and now you can visualize what that looked like with those tabs all i need to do now is weld these together with boolean operations so again with this add modifier boolean and i'm going to use this object as the boolean piece union apply and I need to keep track of all these cylinder numbers that appear. I need to keep track of which one was which. Um, okay, so that cylinder, I can delete that. Okay, because now this is part of it. It doesn't get rid of the original. So click this, add modifier, boolean, add object, this one, and We'll union those and apply it. And then I can get rid of this cylinder. Got rid of the wrong one. Okay. Let's see. What did I do wrong? Did I did I not apply it? Let's try this again. Okay, so that's selected. Boolean. So this object apply and hide this real quick to select this and delete it bring this back okay now it's there all right so that has those tabs on it 
And for these, I'm just going to try to hack something with it before I make them part of it. I'm not going to do any straight measuring. I know these need to be short. Uh, how short, I don't know. How long? I don't think the length makes a difference as long as it doesn't exceed this height. So going from the Y direction here, I'm going to take these pieces and go into vertex edit mode, grab all these, I have a global distance, my height is 2.5, I'm just going to go to 1.5, you know what, it only selected half of them, you know why, because I didn't have x-ray turned on, so Z, uh, control Z to get back out where I was, let's turn on x-ray mode, let's grab a bunch of these, Set this to 1.5. There we go. That should give me something to work with. You know, to be safe, I'm going to make it 2. Because I don't know if I'll lose anything in the print. You know, printing it might cause part of it to disappear. I'm not sure. And then while I'm at it here, I'm going to take... Um, deselect them all. Grab the bottom. Hit grab in the Z direction and just shove them up inside. Get them out of view. And then when I hit tab, you'll see that's there. And we're still in X-ray mode. That's why it looks transparent. But going back to Y perspective, we're going to do the same thing to the other piece. So go into edit verti vertexes, vertices, grab all these. And then by the numbers, set it to 2. Bring them down, you select them all, grab the bottom ones, and then grab in the Z direction to shove them up, in, shove them up inside. No particular position. As long as it's inside the volume, the Boolean operation will put them together. And I'm going to turn off X-ray mode. Uh, turn off X-ray mode here. And then we'll just do, um, so get out of that mode. So we'll take this, the base piece, and do a Boolean operation with this cylinder. And we're going to do a union and apply it. And then I'll pick that cylinder, delete it, so that leaves the remaining part. And again, this piece, Boolean, to that cylinder. Union, apply, and then we'll delete this cylinder. Did I do something wrong again? Did it select difference and I missed it? Okay, let's try this again here. So, add modifier boolean union to this object. Apply. Why is it poking through? Okay, there might be something wrong with that mesh when I did what I did with it to shorten it. So, I'm going to do this. I want to make it part of it. Alright, let's go back here. Let's just increase the length of it. Go back into this mode. Select these, grab it in the z-axis. Let me just put it down into the, I guess called pulling it down into the plastic a little bit more. Get out of this mode. Select this, add modifier, boolean to that cylinder, union, apply. I think I know what I did wrong. I think when you select a, another object, it automatically switches the difference. We'll find out for sure here. Take this, delete it, 
again what's happening here. I might have some complexity in my geometry here that's causing a problem. All right. I can still work with this. Uh, I'm just going to edit this object instead, since I already have the hole cut here. I want to see what happens if I try this. Let's go into, yeah, you can see I have all these weird, this weird geometry. I need to clean it up. There is a function for this, and I forget what it is because I don't use it very often. Uh, so again, I'm going to go crude on this one. I, I don't want to go crude on these things, but sometimes you have no choice. I'm just going to try something here real quick. I'm going to hit B. And I'm going to select all these. And B. If select all these. How did it deselect? Why is it deselected? Maybe I just need to restart Blender. Okay, I think I selected a good ring here. Now, if my goal is I should be able to extrude this and move it up one point or two millimeters, taking it to 3.897. So if I hit E in the Z axis, see how I'm pulling that up? What did I say? 3.8 something? 3.89. Too high. Let's go down from where it was. Yeah, it's going too high on it. That looks better. All right, so I keep hitting the center mouse button and it keeps changing my perspective on me. All right, so I have that. Let's see if I don't get anything weird. It looks like I have holes in it. See that? It looks like there might be holes in it. This is the problem with some Boolean operations and programs like this. If too many pieces line up, uh, it's going to react differently. Uh, it's not going to want to behave properly. What I should have done was clean up the uh, geometry at first. And, and that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to pause this video and do some clean up and see if I can get this to look better. Okay, um, I have it fixed. I took a different approach to it, uh, tried to be a little more systematic. So what I did was, the way I did it first is I, I created, I, I, I unioned this with this, then you, and tried to union that with that and whatnot. What I did instead is I created this and unioned it with that. And then having this whole piece union with the master one instead of going off the master right away. So that cleaned things up a bit. Uh, of course it didn't. Um, I have a hole in the bottom. But you know what? This can be fixed too. Uh, and the way I'll do that is... I'll select this object. Go into this mode. And it'll make a liar out of me again. So that's a face right there. And see how the faces are going. So I just need to box select.
I don't know why it's not letting me select those. Now I can always do it the old-fashioned way, one at a time. Maybe I'm running into memory issues and I just don't feel like shutting everything down right now. Again, it's a crude way of doing it. But Blender, believe it or not, is not... considered a 100% program and if I select all those and I hit F for face it fills it in uh, again very crude way of doing it but it works in a pinch so do this on this side once you have the face in place it then becomes a solid object however they, they call these solid objects with no odd holes in them they, they call them a manifold object. That's the, the term. If this is, when I get all this done through all this complex Boolean operation, which creates all these weird issues, and I load it up into a 3D slicer program, and it says it's not manifold, uh, I, either the 3D slicer will fix that for me, or I can uh, load it to a site online, which will fix all that stuff and make it a manifold. Because if the slicer cannot find where a solid volume is, it's not going to be able to do its job to slice it into the layers that it needs to do a 3D print. So, oh, you can see I missed one here. This, to this, to this, face, I think that's got it. All right. I have two faces here instead of three because I missed that. But it does now look like it's manifold. It's coming together. And, and it is. It is coming together. So there is most of the piece as originally visualized. Now all I need to do is put that switch pin in place, which I said was how much in diameter. Switch pin was 2.3 millimeters. In diameter so to do that again we add another cylinder let me get back to solid mode here so it's coming together and and we don't see any holes in the geometry there so this is looking good so far and I'm gonna save this I'm just gonna hit save I'm gonna put it over what I last used And the switch pin is add mesh. Notice how I did most of this with cylinders. That's going to be 2.3, 2.3, and for its height, I measure its height. I did not measure its height. And let me do that now. Its height is looks like it's two millimeters, so I don't have to change this value. That's correct. But you know, I will change it. I'll actually make it two point one, and you'll see why shortly. It gives me something to work with. Now, here's the real trick. Where do I put it? I'm going to go to uh, mesh mode here. When we, in the original, or the, the earlier when I was showing all the pieces and how they come together, I had to figure out how far off from opposite this tab, how far off I needed to go and at what angle to put it. And for this, I'm going to probably have to make a wild guess. And it'll be an object piece that I can move if I had to. And... Let me switch over to my other camera here so we can see this. And I'm going to zoom out just a wee bit. Get some view here. All right. So, wow, I'm already two and a half hours into this. And thank you for watching if you're still here. Uh, this piece had the tab going down. And 
I think it came pretty much straight off of here. It looks like it meshes pretty good. So if I were to guess, I would say that the piece is, if this is vertical, and this, of course, horizontal, I would say the piece is about 60 degrees this way. For me, that's counterclockwise. For you, it's, well, I guess it's still counterclockwise. Uh, but comparing it to the position of this pin, I'm going to move this piece now by grabbing it. And I'm going to do a, let me, let me go back here. I'm going to grab this piece now, and I'm going to freehand move it to about that spot. Because it looked like it was closer to that pin there by a certain amount. So I would figure that's where it's at. And off camera, I'm going to look at it one more time. And that does look about right is not that far away from in fact it's probably more here but I'll go with that for now So why did I add that extra 0.1 millimeters? This is why. We go to this mode here. Zoom in a little bit. I'm gonna grab this and move it in the Z direction. And when we're moving it down, um, I think it went down far it was two millimeters high this is 0.9 okay so i only need to move it one point and it's 1.9 all right See, this gives it right in there, it gives it some meat to grab onto when I make, when I Boolean join this. Uh, however, I'm not going to Boolean join it now. I'm going to save this now. Let me go back to solid, solid mode, just so we can get a, a visual of this. So there's the tab that turns it. Those are the pins for the, uh, ele for the potentiometer wipe. Although this looks a little too tall, I'm gonna leave it be for now. So I'm going to save this. I think this is finished. The only thing I'll need to do after this is tweak it. So I'm gonna save this project now and I'm gonna call it I do save as, like I said, it takes a little time for Blender to decide what it's going to do. There we go. And I'm going to call, call this Pot Wipe Semi-Final. Because in order for me to do anything with this as a, um, a 3D printed object, I'm going to have to export this object as what they call an STL file. Uh, but first I have to merge this because I have two separate objects. I have this, which I'll add a Boolean modifier for this object union apply. There we go. Okay, so that's that. I believe that's the finished object all goes well I should be able to print this and insert it into the, uh, the potentiometer and it will work 
long as I have my measurements right. If it doesn't, then I can take other measurements and tweak it. So I just need to now select this object and export it as an STL. And it keeps the same name, so I'll export it as an XTL or STL. And that's the design. I, I know it took a long time. And again, I thank you for watching. Um, I told you sometimes these things take better part of a day for me to work on, and I thought I'd, you know, put it in a video. I can only imagine the number of days it'll take to upload this to YouTube. But I haven't decided if I'm finished with this, I'm going to make another video or. Uh, I may tack on additional video to this, which shows the um, the process loading it up into a 3D printer soft uh, slicer. Actually, no, I won't do that. The next video attached to this will probably be uh, um, the actual uh, finished product and getting ready to put it back into the potentiometer. Okay, what the heck, I'm, I'm going to show you um, the next step in the process for the uh, 3D uh, printer slicer. Um, I use, since I'm using a resin printer, I actually have an Elegoo Mars Pro 2 printer. It doesn't have a huge print volume, but it's perfect for things uh, this size. And the recommended slicer program it uses is called uh, Chitubox. C-H-I-T-U-B-O-X, and this is the interface here. Now, uh, I had already exported the, the object into an STL file, so I'm going to load it back up in here. So, I do want to make a new folder. There we go. There's the object. The way it sees it now this this print area is about five by three inches plus or minus so this looks like it's about the right size remember what i said even though i was using meters in blender it actually converts to millimeters in this these kind of programs so that's the item itself we'll get into view here i can also rotate it around and look at it uh everything is at like any part that's green is actually touching this is the print bed uh, visualized uh, and in in a resin printer it actually prints upside down uh, the bed goes down into a puddle of resin material and then uh, a UV image forms the the shape and then it lifts up and then comes back down again at 0.5 millimeter uh, height differences uh, to create 0.5 millimeter layer um, resin objects now the thing with resin printing is it's best to have a fair amount of the surface touching the print bed because that's ultimately what's adhering the whole thing to the print as it goes down prints comes up goes down comes up goes down uh, and each time it forms a new layer it actually that new layer sort of sticks to a special transparent plastic that's in the uh, resin tray and if it's grabbing on too tight when it goes to lift it'll break the piece and if there's not enough to hold on to things uh it'll it'll never it'll never continue um adding the layers one of the like if i try to print this the way it is right now this would be the only holding point and it will actually print this first cylinder just fine but then when it gets to this layer that well actually even this layer uh, there's nothing adhering this to the bed so that plastic isn't that rigid when it's a 0.5 millimeter you know thick layer that it, it won't it won't have a very good shape so what we need to add to this are um i'm gonna try something here real quick um no i don't need to i, I don't need to modify the position on this i might be able to work with what's here we need to add supports and the supports, as you see as I try to do this, supports will give it some additional plastic to use to add some rigidity to it 
the, the distance between say this point and this point aren't a whole lot so there there will be enough plastic material and supports to keep this difference rigid and when I turn on supports, I can choose light, medium, or heavy, depending on the item. You can see how it, all those little gray dots show how much it thinks it needs for support, cons considering the surface area of the print. Uh, and I could be wrong on this. I'm still learning how to tweak these to get a perfect print. Uh, but looking underneath here, I, the, these are all the support points it will create automatically for me. And you notice it also lifted it off the bed. So everything will be supported, including this part. This part will not be touching the surface. It will actually be under a support. Now I can change that if I wanted to. I can, uh, I can do what's called a Z height of zero, and it'll at least give me a firm a adherence to the print bed for those. And then I'll just have little supports under here and then other supports. Actually, I might not even create a support there. It took me a while to understand why I needed to have a, a lift in Z height. Uh, I thought it would make it look, look weird, but it's still fine. So what I can do now is these look like they may be good enough for the amount of plastic between them and the amount of support it creates. It should be good enough, but I want to make sure certain areas of this hold well. So I can... I can move a couple of these like all right let's do it this way let's just have it auto generate the supports there we go auto generated supports now why didn't it go to the ground okay let me remove all the supports I'm going to go back to the original five millimeter that it set. So I'm going to do all the supports. It's not showing me the base for some reason. There we go. There's the base. And now I'm going to go back here. I'm going to go back down to one millimeter. Remove all the supports. Add them again. That's better. That's better. Okay, so these supports will actually print. As I move this, you can see the layer lines as they go up. But I noticed it missed these. I want those included too. So let's remove them all again. I don't want it too high off the print platform. But I want it to have all the supports there. There we go. Now all of its original support positions are good but I want to reinforce this because of certain uh, like I want to reinforce under here so for that I can do oh how do I do this cancel how do I add an individual one I never added them individually I actually trusted So again, I'm learning something new here. All right, so we'll go to auto manual support, add support. There we go, click there, new supports in place. And some areas where I think it, I need to reinforce the level surface, I'll add more supports. And just to be safe, I'll put one there, one there, and I want it to be supported. I don't know why it did that. Okay, so that looks like it's going to do what I want it to do. Gives me some decent supports. 
because when this prints it'll print this layer then keep going up and then eventually as you can see here it keeps printing up the layers until it's all done and the nice thing about a resin printer is unlike other 3d printers which have to draw the layer one you know one thin line of plastic at a time this one does the entire layer in one shot so it, it's faster in that sense so now i got my supports in place except this one because i put that in there i'll go with everything else it recommends and i'll click on a slice here and now it's going to did it slice it already yes it did you can see on the left hand side each slice and on the right hand side you can see each layer in its cross section so it's actually going to print this first and then it's going to build up more plastic as it goes and then eventually add those supports which then it'll start adding everything else that's underneath the supports to continue printing until it ends up with a finished item that i will take off the the print bed i would break off these little support tabs i would put the item into a um an alcohol wash and then to clean off any loose resin and then I'll put the item into a UV uh, chamber to let the um, UV lighting harden the resin. So that's what uh, it takes to set up a 3D print for, for resin. And I will go and print that now. Export it and print it now. And have it ready for my 3D printer, which I haven't used in a long time. So uh, hopefully it's... Uh, going to work out for me i might have to re-level the print bed and probably try a fresh mix of uh, resin in the resin chamber and also another thing you see here it says that it'll take 27 minutes and 39 seconds to print that's pretty fast Okay, um, I had a, it didn't print right the first time around, and I understand why. Uh, when I showed you all my settings for uh, using the slicer, this is the first time I used the slicer software on the computer I'm using now. Normally I use another computer to do all my 3D uh, slicing, that's where all my programs are. So I had the wrong settings for exposure time uh for each layer i use the default value of 2.5 seconds it actually should be closer to uh, 8 to 10 seconds per layer so what happened was the image didn't or the uh, the object didn't adhere all that well uh, but i got a rough shape that i can use to i mean it, it's a failed print but you know my drill sergeant used to say hey we can work with failures but then again was he talking about me or the the stuff that i needed to learn well anyway um, so as you can see here, we kind of got the general shape and it looks to be about the right size. So that's a plus. Uh, the next thing I, I can check is, and I don't know if it'll work on, on this ring, uh, because it went at an angle. What happened was during the print is this backside is all smooth and you can see those little dots in there. Those dots are where those supports were. Well, they broke off sometime partway during, during the print. Most likely when this larger surface area started to print. And if the layers weren't adhered very well, those things weren't going to hold on very well. If the next one, I'm, I'm running a, a better one now. And if that one fails, then I'll have to change the size of the uh, supports, the, the, the contact point that goes to the plastic. Because normally these supports just get cut off. These just happen to rip off. Um, but anyway, so I have this ring here that you can obviously see it's at the wrong angle, so it might be out of round. But it'll still give me something to work with to see if I'm really close with this uh, uh, potentiometer wipe. And I'm going to see if I can't get this to go over. Um, it doesn't quite go over. Oh, there it goes. No, it almost goes over, and I'll just you know write that up as tolerances, but that does look like it's going to fit. Um, and another thing I can test here, since I have one of the pins, again, I can't guarantee 
its accuracy because the way it printed it it could have been made oblong but i can try to fit it in okay oh it went right into the hole there so that's a good sign so at least the pins would be the right size when i get them and one last thing here and i hope this works because i'm already printing another one is the shaft doesn't quite fit actually that would probably go in this this way no it would go in this way um doesn't quite fit again it could be out of ground and looks like it kind of is but even that's not going to be a problem because this resin material can be machined i can just um file away just a tiny little bit at that to to make it fit but i i think i'm on the right path with this i i think the design actually went quite well no i can't quite get that on there we'll find out for the finished product which i i did i'm, I'm doing some spot video recording of the finished uh or the, the process i decided not to record this one when it printed and just show the result but i wanted to let you guys know okay see there i can make that fit so that would be the white so when this is on here this would cause it to wipe around and i don't notice i don't have that uh little bit that, that's supposed to be the switch protrusion that also came off too probably because it didn't have any decent support and it never printed properly so i'll get this i think this size is great i think the 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 design worked well i just have to get a decent print and it just might require me to tweak a few things on the um the, the slicer to give me something that actually maintains the full shape so i consider this a successful failure at least gives me a preview of what i can do and the fact that the design was uh pretty much on track so uh, I'm going to hit pause here which of course again you won't see the difference of my nearly three hour video or should I say my uh, uh, <laughs> wow this I, I, there there were shorter um, uh, Marvel comics Marvel Universe videos but this is what it is I can't break this into pieces you won't get the idea of the entire process all this just for one potentiometer but i still hope that you, you're learning something from it and getting some ideas okay this is my uh resin printer it's a Elegoo Mars 2P P stands for Pro and I have my um, file ready to print on the USB drive there all I gotta do is select print and then nice thing about this is it, it creates little images of the exported to print file and so this is the one I want here this is the uh, um, for the potentiometer and then I just tap that gives me a close-up view of the there it is pot wipe semi-final and I hit the play button so what happens is and there's gonna be some reflection here I'm gonna hold this still so you can see the motion the build plate works its way down all this until it gets to a like a pit of resin material um, and it'll actually sink into the resin material. You'll see as, as the, the resin flows over the top of the build plate. And it gets down to what I, what I mistakenly, uh, was the, well, look at all the dust on that thing. What I mistakenly uh, described as 0.5 millimeter layer height. No, it's actually 0 0.05 millimeter layer height. Very, very thin layers. And hopefully I can get there we go now it's going in and then you'll see the resin wash around it there it is it's it's down in the resin so what happens is this build plate gets close to something called a um, FEP material at the bottom it's completely transparent and underneath that is a high resolution LCD display black and white so what it does is go down here see that little image 
that's the first layer. That's that's the support layer. That's why it looks really funky because uh, each of the support posts is, has a square bottom to it. So it's now exposing that the LCD uh, screen underneath that print tray has um, you know the high resolution LCD display, and whatever you see on this image here is actually the clear part where UV light from the underside of the, um, the printer shines through. And as long as that UV light is exposed in that filtered, uh, masked fashion, it's going to harden the resin in that area, in, in, the, uh, in the pool of resin. And then what it did there is it, it finished its 45 second exposure for the first layer, and then it would lift the um, it lifts up the print bed a little bit and then puts it back down to do another 0 0.05 millimeter gap and then this is the next layer it's it's printing so it keeps doing that over and over again 0 0.5 0 0.05 millimeter gaps so the, the uh, and maybe I can catch it here when it's done exposing it doesn't really tell me how long it's got left on an exposure it just tells me how long it's got left on um, the whole print uh, but when it's done with the exposure, it will uh, lift up. There we go. Now it's going to lift up just a wee bit and then go back down, but keep an additional gap. So the gap is going to change each layer. Uh, and then what happens is the resin that's stuck between that gap uh, is going to harden for the next layer and then adhere to the previous layer. So it says here 44 minutes to print, 3 out of 157 layers so far so and it's been going at it for four minutes so far so uh, we'll get back to this as it gets close to finish and cross our fingers that uh, it will actually uh, have a good print okay the print is done and I have it actually hanging at an angle here it helps the uh, leftover resin drip off. Let me see if I can't zoom in here and see it. Hopefully this turned out okay. I can't really tell while it's still coated in resin and of course it's not going to focus for me. Um, so we'll let this drip and then I gotta run it through uh, this device here which is uh, an alcohol bath that allows it to uh, rinse the the remaining resin off the surface and then after it goes to the alcohol bath the same the same device will also create the uh, UV light that will harden the resin so that's uh, looks like it turned out okay yeah, we'll find out if not I'll be making some changes to this and probably reorient the the item to be printed sometimes working it kind of flat like that's not as good as say putting it in a, at an angle and now here is the alcohol bath it's a little cloudy in there because of the other resin stuff I've washed in it but uh, it'll, it'll rinse around three minutes and then I can remove it from build plate and put it back in this without the alcohol bath to do a UV curing. And finally in the same device this is getting a UV wash of light. I know it looks kind of blue and yellow instead of UV but this uh, yellow filter on top of it actually works pretty good. Give you a hint and let me show you what happens when I lift this a little bit. See, there's the UV. It, it, um, it's it's really purple, but it uh, the sensor in this thing is you know, doesn't tune into UV very well. So anyway, uh, after a couple minutes, that'll be done, and I'll be ready to process it. Okay, and here is the final item. I still have the supports on it. Uh, it looks very close to what we had uh, in 
the Blender app. Let me switch to that. So there it is in Blender. There it is as a finished product. And everything looks pretty much in proportion. Let me just throw this in for comparison. Get an idea. It looks like I have dimensions pretty well set. Yeah, you saw that in the mistake version. But now we have all sorts of fine detail. And I don't have my little... Oh, there we go. There's my pointing stick. Um, so there's the pins for the, for the wipe. And of course the ring for it, and then the the cutout for the for the shaft. And one thing it didn't print, and I don't know if actually it's really going to be a problem, is you can see back here it didn't do that drop piece. And I think that has something to do with. Uh, let me switch over to um, the the, the Chido box software, which I left open. And go back here. I think that might have something to do. See how that's dark like that? I think that might be a problem with the way it interpreted stuff. That could have been my a mistake on my part when I extruded those faces inward. What I should have done instead in Blender was instead of extruding whole faces inward, I should have just taken the last few uh, vert vertices at the end and extruded those that would have prevented an overlap. So this, this is an overlap material that I believe is confusing uh, the, the Chidu box software. So I'm going to, I want to go forward with what I have right now and I can fix this later and, you know, it back in Blender and um, do something with it there. So going back to here. So anyway, I normally remove the supports before I put the piece on for UV um, hardening, but I just left these on so you can kind of see how the process works is, you know, it, it prints upside down, you know, you can see the texture there, that's the base plate, it's, it's a textured metal surface, uh, so it, it prints the layer by layer, uh, 0 0.05, or they call it 50 microns, there's 157 layers between here and here, and this is only, this is only, get this in here, seven millimeters, 7.3 millimeters thick, 157 layers in 7.3 millimeters. So very, very fine resolution printing. And what I usually do to remove these is I'll either use, you know, a sharp edge like this, but I wanna be careful because of the fine details. Uh, or I'll uh, I'll get in and start snipping away with uh, a pair of diagonal cutters because diagonal cutters have the flat edge on them that can really get close to the surface of the object. So I'm going to cut through these here. And they generally remove fairly easily. I just got to be careful I'm not snipping anything that I need that may look like a support. Sometimes when you get a few of the supports off, you can just break it off like that. It allows you to get in and cut more supports. I just gotta make sure I, I am careful and I do not get that little protrusion, that little tab, because that's needed for the switch and the potentiometer. Okay, now you may notice that this surface is all misshapen, and I, I don't think that'll be too much of a problem. That could be. However, as I said before, this is a machinable surface. I can actually very carefully sand or grind that down. 
and I don't have any of my sanding material uh, within reach. So I'm going to see if I can't find a small file. I, like I said, I don't know if that'll be much of a problem. This part is actually going to wipe against uh, a surface area. So this, let's just say this is the back side of the potentiometer. This will go in there. The uh, this piece, the, the the wipe, will go on here. And this is a good check. Let's, let's make sure this this works. Didn't drop in. I wonder if I can squeeze it on, or if I might just have to bring in the outer dimension of that ring. Yeah, I think it's actually a little too big because this metal piece is not going to snap on. And again, I can fix that and reprint it. It, it really doesn't take that long. Sometimes you can fit these things over. But all right, so I went a little big on the tolerances. Let me just see if the, the, the pins work. Pins look a little fat too, so I'll bring those in also. Or if I'm I'm wondering if there's two different sizes here. Okay, so I'll bring the pins in a little bit, not by much. And this is trial and error because I don't have a, a working original to test this off of. But you can see, I, I pretty much got things to uh, tolerance and size, and then I can fix that little bit that that didn't didn't print over here. And try it again so it's getting there all this i guess to uh you know save 10 bucks on on a tensiometer uh or for that matter i don't even think it's it's that point expected i'm being able to use an original piece that isn't made anymore because it was designed for the the item that it's that's being fixed so no it's a shame that this doesn't fit, but I'm not worried. I will just modify the original Blender file by selecting these vertices and just tightening them in just a bit, just a bit on the X and Y axis. And the same thing for the two pins that hold uh, this on it. I don't have that precise of a measuring tool, so I got close. I think everything's in the right position. I just think the uh, it's just a little too wide for the holes that it needs to go through. So, uh, and I will not be recording that stuff. I'll just make that change, go to the printer with it, and uh, be back with a hopefully fitting piece. Okay, I'm back with a, another version of the printed part. This time I did a more recommended layout in the printer, especially for an SLA printer like this, is I printed it at two different angles. Uh, what that does, it, it allows me to have um, better uh, build without a lot of what we saw here, this, you know, see that kind of puffy look to it. It, that that comes from trying to print completely flat onto into the uh, resin area, and some of that is probably trapped resin inside of there, creating that flat. And it's like it's almost like little pillow bubbles that are filled. Now the the, it, the, the stuff's you know it, it's it's hard, but uh, you can see on this one that I eliminate a lot of that if I print at an angle, and I'll show you why. I'll switch over to the uh, Chitu box application and show you how this works. Um, moving it in two different angles allows me to uh, watch as I pull this lever down. This lever will show the cross sections for each layer. See how I'm only printing just a little bit per layer? Uh, there's not a whole large surface that's going to be hitting at once, except for the very bottom where the supports are. Okay. When you print with resin, like this, you want, you don't want to have too big of an area that's going to 
print it once because when the build plate moves up and comes back down, it can inadvertently trap bubbles of resin in large surface areas. So, and, and these base pieces, they really don't count because they're, they never really have a chance to build up anything. There's, there's nothing hollow above them, above them being, that's, that's top, that's bottom as it prints in the direction of gravity. So printing it at this angle was pro probably what I should have done at first outside of, you know, the wrong dimensions. So getting back here, I'm going to go ahead and cut this piece out. Notice it did print that little tail piece in there. I, I really had to play with the mesh. It was from all the bullying, bullying splices from rounded corners and stuff like that. It, it created a big mess in the geometry of the, of the item of the object. So I'm going to zoom out. So a little more room in view. Yeah, the geom geometry got really messed up uh, within Blender, so I just had to, I spent a lot of time breaking that down and removing unused vertices and faces and whatnot and just trying to rebuild it manually as simply as possible. Maybe this will just peel off. Yeah, there we go. Didn't really have to cut it. It peels off on its own. Just have to do a little trim right here. There's a little bit of a support. And that's about it. Looks like all the pins and stuff worked okay. Now here's the real test. Will this fit around that ring now? Yes, it does. Will it fit on the pins? It looks like it's going to do so. Both sides. There we go. Now that's a much better design. And, and the last possible thing, Will the shaft go through? Please do, please do, please do. And it did. Look at that. So now I have the replacement piece. What I need to do now is take this shaft off this piece because now I have to put it back together in the potentiometer. And mesh all the different layers because it's it's the bottom with the switch and it's this piece then it's the wipe here and then it's the conductive part the conductive ring the, the carbon you know the resistor part and then this goes on top and of course the shaft has to go through so that actually turned out really good and let's just see how well it holds up in uh in the potentiometer itself. I'm going to move my camera so I can redirect it towards the potentiometer body and, and start to assemble this. Okay, and let me get my microphone in a better position. I might have to talk a little loud to get to this. I don't want to get the microphone in my way as I'm working, but I still want to be able to, of course, get audio. So, I have okay, so in here is the on off switch, and I believe this is in the off position, which means this is going to go in with that nub it's going to go right inside that slot there uh, but first i need to assemble this part and to do that i just sandwich that in here actually i need about 10 hands to do this i also want to make sure when i get this together have it set the right way for uh, putting the clips back on it. If that's the right way there. Okay. 
this thing, the, the metal piece here with the shaft is not moving. It's like it, it hit some indents where they belong. And this piece is still together over this design. And which way is up. This goes down here. I'm going to assume that I put it that way. That means the weights Guess I got to get this on the right way, or else uh, it's not going to work for that good. That being in the off position. That would be there. And I'm turning this on. So if you click that, that means my starting point of this is going to be right there. So this would go over this way, I believe. Keep it in camera here. This is a moment where one hand's holding one thing, another hand's holding another thing, your third hand's holding something else, and your uh, tail is swishing the flies out. You want to put this together here. Put the metal piece in place in a lot. And then set the wiper here. Make sure that I have the shaft lined up properly. Okay, that looks like it's in there. And I'm getting a sweet motion, which is good. That's what I want. And then let's put this in here. I hope everything just comes together. Because the uh, sweep is on, um, it's, it's actually turned off. It's not conducting in its current position. You know, I could get this all together in that plastic piece of stuff. I won't put it past it because it is an untested type of plastic in here. It would be sad if it happened that way, but I'm not going to be uh, too upset about it. I just want to. I think I'm going to have the harder part just to get those pieces to go in all at once, all the different layers going into the, the case of this thing. Maybe I'm being blocked by that switch. It's kind of hard so easy on the broken. I'm going to give it a bit of a band and then go fixed. That's all that's going to go down. There might be an expected gap here. It looks like it is. So, let's see if I can find it. And I'm, I'm getting completely out of view here. Let's see if I can't find it. So, we're going to try to try to bend these tabs down at least part way. Cut this thing off. Trying to keep everything in view here. Let me try to tilt this camera. Oh, I know why. It's not tightened in its, in its spot. There we go. 
guess I could have you know, taken this out of circuit, except I didn't feel like going soldering it anything when I first took it apart. Some action, I'm still looking good. I don't know if there's supposed to be a gap here or not. It looks like the way that it sits, that's going to be a natural gap. It's just a matter of getting the rest of it all seated properly. I usually end up tearing these things apart, not putting them back together. And that may be messy now. Then the finger pressure. Click on, click on. There it is. Get the click. Click off, click on, click off, click on, click off. All right. That's broken. I don't know how much it'll stand the test of time. I think the real trick is being able to get these things clamped down enough that this thing will stay and it won't shift. to a stop. It's also a little stiff to turn. But I think that might work its way out over time. I might just have to put a, a shot of lubricant in there. That kind of down. Okay. 
definitely has a different feel to it. I may have to reseat things. I think I think this went down too far. You can see that there. Um, however, I want to see if I can try something here. Adjust the uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and plug it in. Make it off. And then turn it on, see if I get some kind of lights and stuff. Let me zoom out a little bit. Okay, I don't see any lights because uh, I'm not operating anything like that yet, but the motor started to run. The belt's turning, which is what it's supposed to do. I don't have all the levers in here to press and switch to turn the thing on, so but the drive motor is running. And I mean, this kind of other stuff that I'm took it apart, so I'm going to go here and turn it off, and the motor stops running. So, that part worked by design, and I think I just have to take this out and kind of reseat it, try again. I, I may remove it now, uh, or you know, actually later. It's, it's kind of late at night for me right now, but I think I'll remove that, unsolder it, and build it together, you know, on a, not hanging from the device, but out of the machine, just to ensure that everything's seated properly, because I think I did close it too tight on one side. Anyway, that is my three, almost three and a half hours of video from start to finish of discovering a problem. Well, identifying the problem, it was discovered long before I took it apart to identify it. Uh, identifying the problem, going through ways of fixing it, designing it uh, to measure out you know, the, the part that's needed, and fabricate one, and putting it back in to make sure things are testing and working. So, all right, thank you for watching, and uh, we'll catch you on the next item that I decide to repair or replace or, or fabricate parts for. Okay, and one last recap on uh, this volume control repair. I actually had to uh, turn that the metal wiper uh, 180 degrees to get everything to work right. I had it in the wrong direction. That, that uh, little notch that was in the casing of the potentiometer was actually to keep the three tabs of the potentiometer from c contacting, you know, um, the metal case, you know, to you know, keep anything from shorting out. So, I have it all put back together, and I'm going to listen for the click. Nice little click. I'll turn the volume up. You can hear kind of the background hum, the noise. Uh, turn the tone up a little bit here. So, the volume control is working. It comes to a stop. It's another reason why I had to turn that around 180 degrees, because it caused another part to turn around 180 degrees. Um, and now I have click on, click off, control. And just to prove that it works. So volume is going down, volume is going up. And I think I have a, a tape that's been recorded over. There we go. So, 
I don't want to put too much audio in here. I don't want to give uh, you know YouTube too much money, but it does does show that the volume control does work, and I was able to turn the device off. So success.